How's that for a start to our morning? Yeah. Thank you all so much, and welcome to all of you to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, where our mission is to join together to create a nourishing liberal religious home and to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in our wider world, or as we say in short, to create community, find meaning, and work for justice. As always, I want to begin by welcoming all that you come with to this space, all of your unique beliefs, your background, your lifestyle, your experiences, your differences, all that helps make you who you are, and this includes those of you who are in the room with us as well as those of you who are streaming with us this morning. It's so good to have all of you as well. So welcome to one, one and all to our service this morning. I do want to begin by noting that our unity candle is lit at the front of our sanctuary, which is something we do in our congregation when we've lost one of our members. Uh, Patricia Johnson passed away on Monday morning after uh, some struggle with some health issues, ongoing struggle with health issues. I don't know how many of you knew Pat. She uh, was a regular here for many years when I first came and uh, was a real stalwart and supporter of the church and uh, unfortunately started to develop some he health issues that increasingly kept her away and uh, we just got word from her daughter that she passed away on Monday so we want to kindle this candle at the front uh, for the warm light that she offered to us and I do want to uh, remind you once more that we are having a new member orientation next Sunday following our second service from 12.30 to about 2, and would invite anybody to uh, come for that, whether you're uh, interested in becoming a new member or just curious or somebody who wants a little refresher, you'd be welcome. And that includes, of course, happening, uh, uh, those of you who want to attend in person here in our sanctuary, as well as those who might want to uh, stream the service and even uh, pop in on a Zoom and where you might be able to uh, be a, a bit more interactive that way, but in addition to learning a bit of our history, the history of our religion, the history of our church, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have as well. So uh, please consider that. It would be an honor to have you, especially if you're uh, thinking about joining our church. No matter if you're near or far away, we would be so honored to have you. Okay, well, I think that's it. I'm, I'm going to take just a few moments as usual to uh, ask you to greet one another this morning. Now that you've sat down and gotten warm and relaxed, we'll get your energy back up and uh, say hi to someone that you know or don't know. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, more opportunity to visit with one another during our social hour. By the way, uh, there's going to be uh, a cookie sale, kind of a fun, tasty fundraiser. So in addition to the coffee and tea, uh, we're going to have an opportunity to satisfy our sweet tooth today. So be sure and plan to participate in that. But we are going to move forward now by lighting our chalice. The chalice is the symbol of Unitarian Universalism, the symbol of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and our inclusion of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need and may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever it's been found. Our opening reflection today is a synopsis of some writings by Tracy Springberry, and some of you who are longtime members of this church recognize them as if Tracy as being once a UU here. Unitarians have been long in, intertwined with the celebration of Christmas, adding their own take on how to promote their values and generosity, chari charity, and social good. In the 1800s, the Unitarians were trendsetters, well-educated, often wealthy, and had access to the control of the media. Unitarian thinkers began to write about Christmas, bringing their values and theology to the forefront of the conversation. A visit from St. Nicholas in 1823 by Clement Moore, a Unitarian, invented Santa Claus, a chubby and plump, right, and right jolly old elf. He had a single poem, transformed St. Nicholas, a bishop known for the acts of charity, into the myth of Santa Claus. Later, Unitarian Thomas Ness, a cartoonist, placed Santa Claus in the North Pole as a message that he existed for all the children of the whole world. The Unitarians also brought us the Christmas tree when Charles Fallen, a German immigrant, a Unitarian, and a first German professor at Harvard invited several colleagues to his home where he had put up a tree and lit it with candles and covered with ornaments. Unitarians brought us the family gift giving, especially the notion of children giving to parents. The Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, a British Unitarian, brought charity to the forefront of Christmas. I've always thought of Christmas as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, charitable, and pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar year when men and women seem, by one consent, to open their shut up hearts freely and to think of people below them as they really were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures beyond to other journeys. And believe it or not, just modern day Unitarian Universalists, but most people who celebrate the season, that all children receive gifts, that food banks are full, and that at least for these few weeks, people everywhere are cared for. They remind us to be giving, generous, and kind to the people we know and to the people we don't. This, for me, is the spirit of Christmas. I'm proud to say that the spirit of giving itself is a gift from our religious tradition. Come, let us worship together. Our first in-service song is kind of an Advent or getting ready for Christmas song. It's called People Look East. It's number 226 in your gray hymnal if you want to access that, or of course, our screen is right in front of you. So please rise as you're willing and able. Okay.
We are now going to kindle our candles of care for those who are most on our hearts and minds this morning. And we begin as we have been with a candle on behalf of the people of Ukraine and that part of the world who are being most impacted by the violence there. I shared uh, with the first folks at our early service, of course you all know I love virtual reality, and there are some, uh, some reports, some 360 reports on there about what's going on in Ukraine, some, some video and interviews. Uh, but I was in one, one report that was comparing what various cities in Ukraine looked like before the war and what they look like now. And, you know, anyone who's been to Eastern Europe has seen those, those beautiful old buildings that are so well kept and manicured and colorful and uh, so, some, somehow, despite all the, the different types of buildings, the, the architecture harmonizes as they're just beautiful cities. And then to, to see that and suddenly shift to where it's just blocks and blocks and blocks of rubble and destroyed buildings for no, for no reason. For, for no good reason, just somebody decided to lob bombs at them. So, you know, when we, and we've, been, we've been doing this for a while now, you know, starting with this candle. And I never want it to seem like we're just doing it by rote, because this is a very real situation. It, it feels very distant to us because we don't see it all the time, but these little reminders make it so real. What's going on uh, in one of our planet's neighborhoods uh, next door, practically next door to us on this small speck of dust. So we kindle our candle for the people of Ukraine and that part of the world who are being devastated by the violence there. And should especially do so at this time when the prayer of so many of us is a plea for peace on earth. I also want to kindle a candle for church member Alice Peterson who is recovering from surgery that she had earlier this week, so please Think of her at this time. And let's do take a moment of silence on behalf of others that you might be thinking of. And as we do each Sunday, you're welcome to name them aloud at this time if you'd like. Those named aloud and those embraced in our silence and all those who are suffering in our world at this hour, we hold in our community with compassion. And before we have our morning offering, I want to invite actually the, the children. Is that right, Deb, to come forward? Yes. Did you forget? Where are I... they? No, they're there. They're the okay. bells. I tied oh, them yes. this morning. So if the children want to come forward, we're going to do some special things during our time for all ages, but for now, I'd like the children to come forward and, and take a bell. I don't know what in the world you would do with a bell this time of year, but I'm sure we'll figure it out. They will try. 
we I'm might we might have some unharm unharmonious bell ringing here. Okay, we now we gratefully give and receive this morning's <laughs> offering, which helps sustain this community and our mission to the larger world. That was beyond spectacular. <laughs> that was beyond spectacular. Oh. Precious, precious, precious. Thank you. Oh, boy. I don't even know what to say. So, that was just the beginning of the Time for All Ages fun, right, Stephanie? Believe it or not. So, all of you uh, should have received an ornament, or most of you at least when you came in. And uh, if not, there'll be a basket with some extras back there. But this is a, a new tradition. We started it last Christmas. And our tree, our tree trimming party occurs during our service. Now you'd think that that's gonna take up a lot of time, but no, because we've all been given one ornament. We can go up and place it on the tree and be back in our seats within just a couple of minutes. And by coming together as a community, we're able to create this this beautiful thing together. So that will be our time for all ages right now. So please take your ornaments, head to the tree in what is the back of the sanctuary for me, and please uh, have fun.
Yay! And then during our social hour and cookie sale, and you're able to enjoy that beautiful tree, that look at what we've accomplished in just a couple of minutes together. Wonderful. Now, uh, I don't think we should sing our children out to the regular song. I think we should do a round of jingle bells. As the children go, they're going to decorate tree. They're going to decorate cookies during children's chapel today. So I'm not. You can't decorate cookies during chapel. Our chapel today, but. They're going to have fun. So why don't we, Deb, would you lead us in a round of Jingle Bells? Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells, Jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells, Jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse Now is our time in the service for meditation and silence. <laughs> Unitarian Universalism has always understood truth to have a lowercase t, not a capital T. As James Luther Adams wrote, revelation is continuous, which means that everything can be called into question. This theological openness is illustrated by the fact that our UU tradition draws from many sources. For our reading today, I'm going to share the words from a sermon of one of our former ministers. Some of you may remember him. Remember him. He was here between 1911 and 1916. <laughs> Please don't raise your hands. So just, we don't need to know. <laughs> the great John Dietrich, the father of religious humanism. Yeah, this is... Uh, the, the concluding paragraph of a sermon entitled, What is a Liberal? We as a group of people gathering here from Sunday to Sunday call ourselves liberals. Liberalism is supposed to be the prevailing temper and purpose of this society. The question that concerns us all is, are we true to this purpose and temper? Are we liberals of the genuine type or of the make-believe type. I trust we are genuine. If we are not, we must make ourselves such. And we can make ourselves such by being truly free, truly open-minded, truly broad and sympathetic, truly inquiring, truly sincere, and truly brave. For it is these things that make us truly liberal.
despite all the festivities, this is not my holiday sermon. <laughs> Uh, speaking of which, every seven years, like Mr. Spock, who has driven to home to his home world, we have Christmas on Sunday. And that means that we don't have services. Unlike a lot of churches that have services, especially because it's Christmas, nobody will show up at ours. So we... <laughs> We won't be having a Christmas uh, Sunday service, so I hope you enjoy it with your families. There will be uh, some recommended services online that, that we've done in the past. And also I'm working on a little holiday special that I'm, I'm hoping to have ready for you to, to watch at home over the, over the weekend uh, whenever you might want. Okay, so make up for it. But today is not Christmas for my sermon. But it is meant to ultimately be a hopeful service, so I, I hope you'll stay with me while, while we get there, okay? Because we've got to deal with some tough stuff first. And for those who might be visiting for the first time and not, not know anything about our, our religion, uh, uh, our religion is going through some, some con conflict, some controversy these days. And uh, I've, I've been in the midst of that to say the least, and sometimes events uh, transpire that, that require me to address it before the congregation because I want our congregation to be informed about some things that are going on. So this sermon will be a little more esoteric today than, than sometimes, but uh, I think it will also give you an opportunity to understand more about what, what we are about in addition to what we're going through. So to begin with, as I think most of you know, after giving away less than 200 copies of my book, do the math here, less than 200 copies of my book, The Gadfly Papers, at the 2019 Unitarian Universalist General Assembly, I was immediately banned from returning to the assembly, I mean, after just four hours. And within 24 hours, I was publicly condemned in two letters signed by over 300 UU ministers calling me and my book racist, homophobic, and transphobic, ableist, and classist without citing a sentence from it. Within a month, I was fired as an adjunct professor from Meadville Lombard Theological School where I earned my doctorate. The uh, Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association publicly censured me. A year later, I was disfellowshipped from the UUA's Ministerial Fellowship Committee, and today the association has me listed on its website as an abusive bully who is ethically unfit for ministry. Sadly, I am not the first, nor even the most recent minister to endure such treatment. In 2018, Reverend Richard Trudeau raised similar concerns as, as mine, concerns as mine on social media I have reservations about the current UU racial justice ideology, he said, and I'd like to find a place to discuss them with colleagues of all races. Only a few days later, he received a letter of censure insinuating that by merely questioning the UUA's particular approach to racial justice and anti-oppression, he had violated their code of ethics. And just a few weeks ago, Reverend Kate Rohde, a retired UU minister, was formally disfellowshipped in response to personal opinions that she expressed on social media. The UU Association's notice on the matter accused her of defaming colleagues without saying how and of refusing repeated attempts to call her back into covenant. That she categorically denied the validity of any and all claims made and that the Ministerial Fellowship Committee was unable to find an avenue for reconciliation or meaningful remediation. And I take this to mean that Rhodey refused to confess her sins and recant. She was disfellowshipped according to their own explanation for continuing to disagree with them. Now I begin with these examples not to incite outrage but to make the point that in today's Unitarian Universalist Association, disagreeing with the, uh, with the authorities is no longer permitted. Those who do will find themselves shamed and silenced at best, 
and have their reputations destroyed and their livelihoods ruined at worst. Tragically, such suppression and the resulting conflict is also occurring in many of our congregations. Some individuals and small groups want to talk about their concerns, but are being forbidden from doing so by their ministers, their boards, and some of their own members from doing so. Many congregations are losing members as a result. Members who understandably choose to simply walk away rather than to put up with what has become the antithesis of the free religion we once knew. And this is a sad state, if not an end, for liberal religion in North America, which was formalized almost 200 years ago with the establishment of the American Unitarian Association, the AUA, in 1825, but got its unofficial start nearly a century before then. That's when Reverend Charles Chauncey, minister of Boston's first church began preaching that human beings are born with the capacity for both sin and righteousness. That there is good in us. An idea that was initially called Arminianism, but eventually came to be called Unitarianism. Prior to this, well, actually, I should say a hundred years later, Chauncey's Congregational Church was officially named a Unitarian Church. And prior to this, King's Chapel, the first Anglican church in colonial America, established in Boston in 1686, installed a Unitarian minister, James Freeman. That was in 1782, making it the oldest Unitarian church in the nation. And the oldest pilgrim church in the U.S., founded in Plymouth in 1620, became a Unitarian church in 1802. Our religion has been here since the founding of this nation, promoting and demonstrating our belief in human goodness and potential and the virtues of freedom and reason and tolerance. So tolerant are we that unlike so many other religions that continue to fracture, we formed an association with another religion, universalism in 1961. And until very recently have been almost defined by this extraordinary ability to get along exceedingly well, despite our many differences. As the renowned Unitarian Universalist minister Jack Mendelssohn said in 1964, in a Unitarian Universalist congregation, an agnostic may sit beside one who believes in a personal God. At the after-service coffee hour, a believer in reincarnation may stand chatting with one who affirms utter extinction. Such are the diversities in theological belief. Yet today, the infectious intolerance and dogmatism that began in Boston is spreading to our congregation and is tearing them apart anywhere there is resistance to this loss of freedom and reason and tolerance that had defined our liberal religion for almost 300 years. Again, as Mendelssohn put it, the most fundamental of all Unitarian Universalist principles is personal freedom and religion, religious belief. The principle of the free mind. No holy writ dictates, no creed dictates that must be believed. Today, this is no longer the case. Marking the end of an era for religious freedom and liberalism in North America. Along with the loss of personal freedom and our religion, and the worth and dignity of every person that went with it is the loss of our collective freedom to express ourselves through legitimate democratic processes. One of the UUA's seven principles, its fifth principle, is the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. Yet for more than a decade, the systems that once kept our congregations democratically engaged with the association 
have been eliminated and decision-making power has been consolidated into the hands of a very few people in Boston, at our Boston headquarters. Not long ago, the UUA Board of Trustees had dozens of members elected by UUs in districts all over the country. Today, there are seven trustees hand-selected by a committee. As recently as the 2016 General Assembly in Columbus, Ohio, as the UU Association's moderator announced plans to transform our liberal religion into a covenantal one, he also said, district leaders are imagining other ways of shaping governance. Three districts in the Midwest consolidated into one region two years ago, and eight districts in the South and Central Northeast have voted to dissolve and defer governance to the UUA. It doesn't get any clearer than that. The new vision is to defer governance of our congregations to the UUA. Today, what many of us would consider democratic elections of leaders is practically non-existent in the UUA. As in Russia and other authoritarian regimes, we are asked to vote in elections in which the outcomes have already been predetermined by the powers that be. The most alarming example of this regards the UUA's presidential election. Until recently, its presidential search committee was re required to present delegates with, two or, or delegates with two or more candidates, while others could choose on their own to run by petition, which required the support of only 25 congregations. There was no restriction on when one could begin gathering these petitions. So if you know you want to run two years in advance, you could start gathering petitions. That's the way it has been. But this began to change in 2018 when the UUA Campaign Elections Committee issued a report stating, we recommend that the bylaw that allows for running for president by petition be eliminated. 9.6a as it pertains to the office of president in the absence of the will to eliminate this bylaw completely, we believe that the threshold for petition candidates should be raised significantly to at least 50 congregations from at least two regions and certifiable only by the action of duly called congregational meetings. Failing to eliminate this option completely, the bylaws were changed in 2019, doubling the number of petitions necessary to 50 petitions from three regions across the U.S. Petitions that must be formally approved in a church board meeting or during a special congregational meeting. Now this seems an almost insurmountable barrier, but there have, again, never been any restrictions on how early a candidate can begin seeking petitions. At least not until earlier this year, when I informed our congregation of my intention to begin seeking petitions to be on the ballot this June. Within just a few days, the election committee contacted me in a terse email falsely claiming I had violated their rules by campaigning before November 15th, when they would officially announce their chosen candidates. And this is patently untrue. The bylaws clearly separate the petitioning process from the campaigning process and always have. Meanwhile, the deadline for turning in one's petitions is February 1st, which means petitioners now have only two and a half months to convince, contact and convince, you can't mention it before, right? February, before November 15th. So, to contact and convince 50 congregations from around the country to hold special meetings to approve a petition to have them placed on the ballot. Given the requirements most congregations have around holding special congregational meetings, petitioning to get on the ballot has become impossible, which is what the committee expressly wanted to begin with. Additionally, just last year, the UUA asked delegates to approve a 
change to the bylaw requiring the Presidential Search Committee to submit no fewer than two nominations. They can submit more if they wanted to, which would make it really democratic, but, but no fewer than two. They wanted to change that language to state one or more. By having effectively eliminated petition candidates, this would have allowed them to put forward a single presidential candidate. And this move finally proved to be a bridge too far for the General Assembly delegates last year who voted it down, meaning the committee is still required to put forward no fewer than two candidates. Nevertheless, on November 15th, about two weeks ago, the UUA announced a single candidate for the position explaining that one of their nominees declined the nomination. But once the nominations were made, the committee determined that the only fair and appropriate course of action was to move forward with the nomination of their chosen delegate rather than reopening the application process. A clear violation of their own bylaws, reaffirmed by the delegates just a year ago. Their excuse is nonsense for many reasons and has prompted much concern about the UUA's blatant violation of its own bylaws and disregard for even a pretense of democracy. In a recent campaign statement, the presidential appointee said, I am currently the only nominee in the election process, though others may run by petition. In another recent communication, the current UUA president also said, we do have a petition process and have put out information about how candidates can run by petition. Good, I'll get right on that. So under the circumstances, these overtures to democracy sound completely hollow and insult our intelligence. persecuting those who assert their freedom of speech and actively undermining our commitment to democracy is happening in clear violation of our seven principles outlined in Article 2 of the UUA bylaws, which have become problematic. These seven principles, which for many have defined our religion, have become problematic for those involved in this hostile takeover of our liberal religion. This is especially so of the first principle, respect for the inherent worth and dignity of every person. The fourth principle, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, and as mentioned, the fifth principle, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. For we cannot censure, silence, and persecute others if we respect them their freedoms, and their right to self-determination. Nor can we claim to be democratic when we put systems in place that help a handful of individuals determine who will and won't be elected. So the UUA's Article 2 Study Commission recently released a proposal to eliminate the seven principles altogether and to replace them with seven words, which they refer to as our shared values. The words include love, love at the center of the diagram, surrounded by pluralism, interdependence, equity, generosity, justice, and evolution, the latter of which is not a principle, it's a process. But this is the euphemism for accepting what's going on, right? We're evolving. That's where that's coming from. More importantly, the words that really have divine, def defined the core of our religion all these years are absent. Freedom, democracy, independence.
Fortunately, these changes will have to be approved by the delegates, by delegates at a general assembly and have only been released for prior consideration. Even so, it does not appear that genuine feedback about them is truly welcome. An attendee of one such meeting recently reported the UUA is conducting feedback sessions in tightly controlled formats that limit the feedback that you use hear from each other. He further explained that there were no questions allowed and no request for overall opinions about the changes. <coughs> and all of this gets back to my main point. Those of us troubled by what's happening to our religion are not bothered by the beliefs of those responsible. We are simply and gravely disturbed that we have been silenced. Simply wishing to discuss our concerns immediately gets us condemned as racist, homophobic, transphobic, ableist, classist, and any other modern version of the word heretic that can be, that can be thrown at us. And we can live with our ideological differences. That's the Unitarian way. But we cannot live with being silenced or being part of a religion that is regressing into old patterns of religious intolerance, extremism, and authoritarianism. Again, I want everyone to hear me on this. Those who agree with me and those who don't, my issue with the Unitarian Universalist Association is not their ideology as much as I might disagree with some of it. My issue is that they are using their positions of power to silence those they disagree with. It is the UUA that refuses to openly and sincerely engage, to engage with us in mutual settings, not tribunals. Don't call me to a tribunal, and when I refuse to accept your authority over me, tell me that he won't engage. I'll be happy to engage. <coughs> and this really is the truly unethical, abusive, and bullying behavior. <coughs> Yet, this is not meant to be a you've done enough, have you no sense of decency at long last, have you left no sense of decency moment as it was when attorney Joseph Welch spoke these words during the McCarthy hearings. On the contrary, as difficult as it is to hear about what's going on to our beloved and beleaguered religion, as difficult as it is, as it is for some of us to relive these injustices, myself included, this is meant to be an uplifting message. We'll get there, we'll get there. <laughs> as we are now ready to consider the power that we have to adequately address and meet this challenge. Our first advantage is that our congregations remain autonomous organizations independent of the Unitarian Universalist Association. I said independent, not interdependent. I know some of you out there are members of congregations that are in conflict over these matters, and I also know how difficult that is to endure. All of us here do. Especially when your ministers and your church leaders are suppressing freedom and democracy in the congregation that you have loved, that you have been part of, and that you have helped build and support. That's tough. But even if your church isn't able to assert its collective independence at this time, you still have yours as individuals. And that is what keeps you free. And that is where your greatest strength lies. The other great advantage we have is each other. The UUA may have abandoned its liberal members and its liberal heritage, but we have not abandoned each other. Our association may have become authoritarian, but we remain free. 
It may not be willing to hear us, but we can continue to speak. So we need no longer concern ourselves with turning the UUA around. It is not necessary. In the past, the UUA was but our service organization, our service organization that we funded. As its bylaws still state, we funded it so that we can collectively support each other with the ne necessary services we occasionally need. This too is something that we can continue doing because all that is required for doing so is our independence and our continued connection to each other, which we have. So let's stop wasting time and energy hoping to change the UUA and focus instead on what we really need and on our ability to support each other. The first thing we need is to regularly be reminded that we are not alone in the world and that we remain part of something meaningful that is larger than us and our local congregations. We need to remain part of a liberal religion with a rich history, deep roots, and essential values. We also need an organization wherein we are free to speak and think for ourselves and are never censured or punished or ostracized for doing so. That's how we thrive. We need to be part of a community in which we can be great friends with people who have different ideas and identities than our own. Just as Jack Mendel, Mendelssohn described us in 1964. We also need liberal ministers, which means a new way. We need a new way of identifying and certifying those we call to occupy our pulpits. Finding a UU minister who is truly liberal is the number one concern I hear from congregations in search these days. We need information, genuine information like newsletters that aren't filled with propaganda and euphemisms, and an independent magazine that includes letters to its editors, including letters expressing dissent and dissatisfaction. We need classes and curriculum that remind us who we are and where we come from. And religious education that exposes our children and our youth to our cherished liberal values. We need activities that bring us together, including conferences, district meetings, and worship services that make use of the technologies enabling us to include members throughout North America and anywhere else. And we need to reestablish democracy in our dealings with each other by putting a ballot inside every inbox of any member of our association. We have the technology to do that today. We don't have to leave it up to a fraction of a percentage point to make our decisions for us. So today, because we have these needs, and because we have each other, and because we have the freedom to do so, I'm excited to announce the formation of the North American Unitarian Association that very shortly will include individuals and congregations from the U.S. and Canada as members. Those of us working toward its creation, including two members from our local Congregations Board of Trustees and a member of our shared ministry team, along with others from both countries, have been working swiftly to make this happen. But given the mounting upset regarding recent developments concerning the seven principles and the UUA's presidential election process, we felt it necessary to get ahead of ourselves just a little to help alleviate some of the concern, the mounting concern, and redirect it into a positive direction. I want to also make it very clear that the NAUA is not meant to replace the UUA. I still believe the UUA will eventually turn around because I believe it's going down a flawed course that will end in ruin. But this will require new leadership and enough time for them to affect 
real change. And according to my estimates, based on our election cycles, we won't see anything like this happening until at least 2035, at the earliest. In the meantime, we have immediate and practical needs that must be attended to in order for us to thrive again as religious liberals. So I want to encourage our congregation and other congregations to remain part of the UUA so we can use what little voice we have left to help restore it to the open-minded, open-hearted religion that it is meant to be. And I would be very proud if our Spokane congregation becomes a founding member of the NAUA, but this one's not up to me. It will be up to our board of trustees in consultation with our members. But for now, we can feel good and hopeful about the future of liberal religion again, as together we rebuild the relationships and supports that have sustained us in North America for almost three centuries, bound by our shared commitment to reason, freedom, and tolerance. Thank you. Well, can't you just let everyone stand up and applaud first and then? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, no. I'm a supporter of you. I yeah. have one serious question. Okay. Absolutely. That's why you should never listen to rumors. <laughs> of course not. Yeah, the, she, 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 she had heard a rumor that the board of trust, our, our board of trustees has already approved this and have voted, voted to approve this and that that would be a violation of the very democratic principles I'm talking about. Yeah. No. No. Thank you. What an opportunity to squelch a rumor. <laughs> right, right at the start of this. Uh, any, uh, uh, maybe I'll do one or two more questions if, if there's anything pressing. If not, we'll... Yeah, Don. Uh, have you gotten a, a feedback, or is this like uh, the principal people that are on the internet a lot and discussing things? Or no, if, 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 feedback about the NAUA? Yeah. No, we, we've, we've not been making any public statements about it uh, because, uh, it, you know, we're, we're in very, very early stages. We're trying to, to formalize it with document, with the right documents and articles of incorporation and those yeah, sort of things. Well, no, uh, we have a group and that is uh, some members of our congregation and including members of our board. We've been reporting on it at the board meetings during the past two months. Uh, three months now, I guess, and uh, we have members from Canada and members from the south part of the U.S. and from the west side, and so it's a small sort of task task force right now that's just trying to to formalize the organization. So, yeah, and then oh, we got one here, and then Tom. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so, is the NAUA seeking to center the UU7 principles is the UUA uh, thinking of centering the seven principles as its, as its guiding ideals? Uh, no, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a congregation in Austin, Texas that split uh, over this issue. The splinter group in that case uh, were, were the dissenters, and they formed a, a congregation of their own. They called it the uh, UU Church of the Seven Principles. Uh, now, there are lots of congregations that start that are you call themselves UU churches that that aren't official and they've been unharassed but they received a letter from the UUA uh, claiming they were violating cop, uh, trademark issues and they couldn't refer to seven principles a chalice or even use the term Unitarian Universalism so w w but what this group will really do is is go back to I, I think those fundamental principles of freedom reason and tolerance 
And if you, if you go and look at those seven principles, you, those seven principles are really uh, an, art, an articulation of those enlightenment values, right? There, there's actually a whole evolution of, of, of statements of faith that were made over time and they keep changing. And those seven principles which were adopted in 1985 are, are the latest in, incarnation of those. But they're, they're rooted in something much deeper, so. But certainly those seven principles will be held close to our hearts. Okay, Tom, and then, and then we'll just do one more and then we'll, we're gonna have actually a meeting I think on the 14th. Is that right, on Wednesday the 14th in the evening? We'll, we'll let you know more about that. But for now, I'll let Tom have the last question. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for your generosity. That that will be helpful. Helpful. <laughs> he said he's he's committed to uh, to contribute five hundred hours to the cause whenever we're ready to accept that to help as seed money. So oh. that's helpful because we've been spending lots of seeds. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest one was a trademark. You know, getting getting things trademarked. But by the way, Unitarian Universalism is trademarked too. Now, Unitarianism and Universalism are separate entities, but combined, it's a, it's a trademark. So that's why we call it the NAUA. But we will we will include members who are Unitarians, comma Universalists, comma and other religious liberals. Okay. Okay. So I'm so sorry. Pro we probably should should move on because there's cookies awaiting. <laughs> but we'll, we'll we're going to have an official meeting on this uh, coming up later this month, and I'll I'll look forward to helping to answer whatever questions I can. So thank you all so much. Thank Did you, you want to stand and give me a finish? <laughs> Do you want to finish it? No, no, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Teasing. We were so rudely um, interrupted from that standing <laughs> ovation. <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, and given the, given the time, why don't we rise and sing shalom? And please uh, do hands if you would like to do that. Well, we'll also have the benediction too and sing shalom. Oh, that, that's true. You, benediction first then. Maybe. Right. Yeah. So, are we going to sing a song, other song other than that? No, no you just okay. No, let's not. Okay. Out of our business, busyness, we are called back into balance back into ourselves and the silence of our present being. We are called to remember our relationships and our dependencies. We are called to once again feel the oneness which sustains our being in balance with creation and to do so with wonder and appreciation. Amen, blessed be, salam alaikum, and shalom. Sure.